Good afternoon. My name is Brown Cannon. My wife, Marty, who is late, she'll be here. Um, and I are co-chairs of the ranch's uh, recognition dinner celebration this Thursday. Um, I got a few of these notes late, so bear with me if I read a few of these out loud to you. Uh, but it's my pleasure to welcome you today to a conversation between the 2019 Extraordinary Leadership honoree, Doug Casebear. <laughs> and Brad Miller, who served as Anderson Ranch's <laughs> Executive Director from 1984 to 1992, and that, and that is the extent of my remarks about you. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I would still talk about this guy, but uh, I, I want you to know I do have one of your pieces, which we oh, absolutely <laughs> love to death. So. Uh, Doug joined Anderson Ranch in 1985. During this time at the ranch, he served as artistic director, associate director, as well as chair of the Arts in Residence program. In addition to Doug's work at the ranch, he has exhibited extensively nationally, internationally, and is in, in numerous public and private collections. Doug has served as pottery ceramics consultant at the UN's International Development Organization and was recently honored with the 2019 Enseca Honorary Membership Award. All right. <laughs> give, him, give him my hand. So there probably aren't very many people in here that need anyone to stand up here and introduce Doug Casebear to you. But that's what I've been asked to do. <laughs> Marty and I have been coming to the ranch for a long time. Marty started coming in 1992, took uh, some ceramics class. When I first came to the ranch, um, it was about probably 2,000. Um, and it was an interesting experience because I was, uh, my, I thought I was gonna take ceramics and I came here and people would stop me and say, that's an interesting name, Brown Cannon, what do you do? Um, and I'd say, well, I'm a businessman, I've got several businesses, and I'm here to dabble in ceramics. And then the years went on, and I kept coming back, and I kept coming back. And now, because of Case Beer and his cohorts, people come up to me and say, what do you do? And I say, I'm a potter. <laughs> and when, when <laughs> And, and, and when it's necessary, I dabble in business. Um, Doug has a lot of friends, and the ones that I got to be associated with to some extent, people like Takashi, Matt Long, Victor Babu, Randy Johnson, Johnston and Jan, Ralph, Sam Harvey, Esther Shimazu, Paul Solner. All of these people, um, enriched our lives, both mine and my wife's. Um, when I first saw Doug put on a throwing demonstration, I qu quickly realized um, that he, this picture that he was throwing was a metaphor about life. Not many of you or many of us that walk into a a case beer throwing demonstration will come out of there emulating many techniques that this man has. Um, first of all, he shows up with an apron um, that has old clay dating back to the 60s, <laughs> hanging off in big chunks. Uh, he proceeds to throw a pitcher using a thimble full of water and expands the cylinder by compressing and pushing down instead of lifting the sides up. But I did walk away with a few life lessons. Freeing up my art, 
thinking out of the box and always wanting a clean apron. <laughs> <laughs> Doug epitomizes what the ranch is about. Sure, it's about art. Everybody's here because of art. But it's really about the people, their journeys, and the life lessons you learn. Doug, the accomplished artist, mentor, and teacher, a man of few words, has brought those wonderful experiences and people into our lives, and we will forever be grateful. Thanks, Doug. Thank you, Ron. Um, before I turn over the microphone, I'd, I'd like to thank the presenting sponsor, uh, Toby Devon Lewis, premier sponsor, ULAT Arts, and others who are making the event possible, including the National Council sponsors, corporate and media partners, and all of you in the audience, and all of you who support this important mission of the ranch. And now... Welcome, Doug Casebeer and Brad Miller. We turned on? I think we're on. Yeah. Thank you, Brown. That was very kind of you. <laughs> I appreciate that. Where well, do you want to start? Well, let's... Uh, In the beginning. Yeah, let's start at the beginning. I, this is the one picture I pulled off the computer. This is a slide I took. Um, probably this is 83 of the year I, before I called Doug. And this is... I just want you to know what has happened since Doug has been here. Uh, so tell me, how'd you, how'd you get here? <laughs> well, I recall, and um, I think Susan can support this, we were having our pseudo Thanksgiving dinner in a hot condo in Kingston, Jamaica, and a phone call came. And you said, I have this proposal for you. Would you be interested? And I said, well, tell me about it. And, um, well, I think we thought about it for a few days. And uh, uh, I had to make a few cold phone calls to some uh, friends yeah. and family in the Valley and mm -hmm. see if this was for real. Like, did this place exist? <laughs> and um, <clears throat> my uncle came by and he said, yeah, it's, it's, it's for real. It's there. And um, I called back and I remember asking Brad, we were just talking about this. I said, does the cabin have heat? <laughs> Wood heat. Yeah, yeah wood, wood heat. heat. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, that was Thanksgiving of 1984, and by I'll never forget it. I drove in to the ranch on January the 15th, uh, and probably the biggest, well, maybe after this last winter, one of the biggest mm -hmm. snowstorms. And um, That was huge. That was, was a huge winter. That was a big winter, yeah. and I began my work at the ranch uh, that January. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And here we are, thirty-five years later. I know. And uh, we're about to say we look the same, right? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> I kind of feel like I'm sitting in an old board meeting and a, a, a staff meeting with a lot of visiting <laughs> artists right now. <laughs> a lot of we can't faces see them here. right now, so, yeah. so it's yeah. okay. Yeah. Um, so. The, the ranch was uh, on a roll, and I, a little, I want to back up. How I got here was in 80, and Caleb Bach was the director, and Caleb really started things rolling. And he got money from the Dow family, and they built the first uh, building in 1980 when I came on. Mm -hmm. Harry Teague was uh, slow construction. He and Bobby mm -hmm. built that building, and that was the first kind of, uh, I think it was like 10 grand they raised to, to start mm -hmm. that building. And um, Jeffrey Moore became director, and then Jeffrey left, and a guy named Doug Pedersen came along, and he was here for two and a half months, and I came into the job. I, I was here for about three and a half years, and I was running ceramics, and then I needed to replace myself, and that's yeah. how you came in. Um, so what happened there was uh, there was a lot of community support finally building, and I have to give Jeffrey and Caleb uh, uh, a credit for bringing in the visual, uh, the fine arts of painting and printmaking, mm -hmm. which really changed the programming here. Mm -hmm. And they set the format of the catalog and uh, all that, mm -hmm. and then we kind of took it and ran. Yeah. Um, we started building buildings. Like crazy. Yeah. When, uh, when this picture was taken, uh, there was a stairway uh, built just the next year, and the photo building had not been built, but the fissures 
had donated money for a, a Fisher Photography Center, and the wood barn had been expanded. But this is basically what the ranch looked like. This place was a museum of buildings in the valley, in a sense. I think there's four or five buildings that came in here. The first cabin you lived in, they're now back That's here. That's right. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we started uh, expanding the programming and the thing took off. Yeah, and I think we had what, two trees? Two, yeah, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And now there's probably two or three hundred trees on this property. Yeah, and they've grown up. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, it's kind of a, it's a metaphor for the ranch itself, mm -hmm. the growth of the trees and mm -hmm. planting early seeds. And uh, what I think was extraordinary for us is the community really backed us. Yeah. You know, yeah. there's well, a lot I think of support. The board at that time with Betsy and um, Jean Jaffe and Betty Moore and all those folks, um, um, we're really behind what we were doing, mm -hmm. and um, uh, they supported studio growth, uh, facility growth, housing for staff, which was ahead of right. the curve at that time. Uh, our board realized at that time that to retain staff meant to grow the organization, and that was really important. Um, and it meant a lot to people who were living here and raising families that the board embraced that value. Mm -hmm. I think the year you came, there was a staff of about 10, mm -hmm. and I was looking at the list, and I think nine out of 10 of them were artists. That's right. Had an artist background. So it, was, it started, and that was the Solner's, you know, Solner started this thing in 68, what was it, 60? 66. 66. I mean, it was artist kind of directed and ran from the beginning. Mm -hmm. So that had to change over time, which you've actually seen. The administration side has had to grow to keep mm -hmm. up with the demand of the, the students, the artists, um, mm -hmm. the scale of the place. Uh, yeah, but I think too, early on, we prided ourselves in the fact that it was an artist-led, artist-run organization, and that those values permeated uh, right into the office and everybody that worked here at the organization. Mm -hmm. That uh, the values of uh, taking risks and exploring in the studio, um, uh, were supported by those that, that needed to help us get where we wanted to go. The board, the staff, and administrative staff. Yeah. Uh, getting, uh, it, was a, it had a craft history. You know, Solner, Sam Maloof came here for many years before mm -hmm. I got here. Uh, David Ellsworth turning. And uh, Jeffrey and Caleb were painters, and Jeffrey had worked with uh, Bud Shark mm -hmm. and Craig O'Brien. And a lot of the visual artists, uh, the painters started coming. I remember Laurie Anderson came here just before you arrived. That's right. She was on tour mm -hmm. with her first album, and she worked with Bud in the print mm -hmm. shop and made their, her second album cover. Uh, it was Mount Daly. That's right. Yeah. So just to kind of put it into perspective, there was roughly about 10,000 square feet on the campus when mm -hmm. I came on. And today, there is 55,000 square feet of studio space and housing. And um, it was a, I think that you, <laughs> you like to say it was, a, it was kind of a trifecta collaboration between myself, our builder Dave Beck, and Mr. Teague sitting right here. And it was really kind of a win-win. We were all on the same page yeah. in terms of how we wanted to approach this. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then and the facilities grew. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, when we built the photography building, I think the city of Snowmass said, uh, we're not gonna let you keep going. Time out. We're going to give you a uh, amount of square footage you have, and we want to see a master plan. Mm -hmm. And that was actually one of the things that we did early on when you were here. That's right. Uh, and we and that was a great move to bring Harry in early on. Mm -hmm. I mean, he and he. I know Harry's here. He was very instrumental in laying this these two kind of circles that interact here. Yeah, the two quads, the residential quad, and the studio quad. Mm -hmm. And I remember all those discussions were about how we could all move about the campus and interact together in a, a positive and creative way. All the studios open up to the upper quad and sight lines were established so that you could see what was going on in different studios at different times. Mm -hmm. So that we were bringing down the fences of craft and opening up this world of art and um, uh, that everybody had a place at the mm -hmm. ranch. And that, that uh, the master plan took us about two years, I think. It, it was in a little booklet. We put a little booklet fundraising. And we started getting funding from the Betcher Foundation mm -hmm. 
Ruth Brown had connections. Ruthie's mm -hmm. run, Ruth Brown. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, there were other people from Denver. Uh, Jeffrey was from Denver, and he had connections there. So we started fundraising outside of the valley and getting grants. Right. right. And um, you're still on a roll here. Yeah. <laughs> Arthur and Sissy Fisher stepped up, and we have yeah. a photography building. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. And that just continued. Yeah. yeah. But to back up just a little bit, the Photography Center was probably the first building that I was the GM for on right. campus. But prior to that, when, <laughs> when I arrived, there was all this snow. And I looked at it and I said to Brad, where's the kills? Where are they at? <laughs> well, they were all under snow. And I began to realize that, and this took us a little while to realize that year-round activities and protecting our uh, facilities and equipment was really about offering a stellar summer program. Mm. And one of the first things that we had to do was cover the kill yard. Right, and that's, you mm -hmm. took that around on your, your father's here and he helped, uh, he was in the yeah. metal building business and that happened. Yeah. So between my dad and I, who was here, we built the first metal building cover the kill yard. Mm. And, uh, and that really sort of set the pace. I think it indicated to the board that we were in it for the long haul and serious about developing our program and facilities. And I remember another a little part of that was Harry realized that that long building, which is one of the two studios right mm -hmm. now is used for ceramics, it got covered with that metal building. Right. And his thought about that building was, well, there's no way to rebuild this. We're just going to cover it like right. we do in Japan and mm -hmm. let it just survive. Mm -hmm. And that happened with the wood shop, your studio, yeah. um, you know, mm -hmm. preserve what's here and then build around it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we are the repository for historical buildings in the valley. Yeah. yeah. We get calls all the time saying, we've got this building in the way of development. Yeah. Uh, would you like it? And uh, Did you ever say no? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I know that one of these buildings, the one you lived in back here for many years, that building actually came from Aspen before I got here. And that's that true. The there was two of those cabins, and so it's now called the Marbrick Cabin. It sets right out here in the back. So it got moved from where the print shop is. So we did a lot of shuffling around in the early days. Um, there's two of those cabins. One still sets in town. Um, but um, when we uh, renovated that building and we took down the roof and so forth, remember the little leather book I found? Yes, right. Yeah. So the uh, miner who built the building drew a little stick drawing of the building. Literally a, a stick drawing. A, literally a stick drawing. And then on the next page, it was how many chickens he traded for the lumber. Yeah. And then he put it up in the rafter so f we could find it later. Yeah. 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 Still yeah. around. Yeah. Uh, Bradley's has it. Oh, he does. Yeah. Right. It's still right. here. Yeah. yeah. Another important event happened early on in your time here is the Chaffins and Lights gave mm -hmm. us the land. Yeah, that was big. That was big. Yeah. You know, we tell everybody in the catalog it's a ranch, but they get here, it's only four and a half acres. That's true. But, um, well, we had a pretty incredible view there for a while. We did. And that, see that yeah. view? That's totally gone, right? Pretty much. Trees. Yeah. Buildings. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, I was actually sad when that building, when that uh, view left. Yeah. That was really beautiful. But I think that what the Chaffins realized was that, and the board realized that, we did not own our destiny. But to own the buildings, we owned mm -hmm. our destiny. Mm -hmm. And so that was a huge thing that happened for the ranch early on, was that it allowed us to grow, develop, and put some permanence in our facilities. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But we fixed a lot of broken pipes there for a while. Oh, boy. Just a, a, a little footnote, that wood shop there, it wasn't usable in the winter because there's no heating. And when I got here, the, f the pipes would just freeze. Yep. And then we knew it was spring when the pipes broke and there was geysers in the I wood shop. I, I, and I, they'd hire a plumber and come in and fix it and then uh, get ready. Excuse me, that was me. <laughs> <laughs> I learned how to sweat pipes pretty right. quick. <laughs> yeah. uh, mm -hmm. uh, I was an interim director here in about 12 years ago, just for four months between directors. And I remember a talk you gave that really blew me away, Doug. And what you talked about was many of the places you have taken the ranch energy around the world. And can you talk about that? Yeah, I've, uh, I think there's kind of a short story, long story in here, but you know, I kind of, you know, when I was growing up, I grew up on the plains of Kansas and I kind of thought, well, I'd be okay 
just as happy as can be sitting on a tractor or framing walls or doing whatever, but all of a sudden I started to travel. And I realized that um, it's incumbent upon an artist to travel, to see the world, to experience the world. And um, Susan and I moved to the Caribbean for three years. I worked for the United Nations. And I began to see things that were impacting me as an, as an individual that I had never seen in my life. And that, to me, was pivotal. And the pivotal part was that I began to see individuals who who were bringing uh, beauty and grace into their lives through handmade objects in some of the worst conditions I'd ever seen in my life. Mm. And that I knew I was blessed, that I was given this gift in life to be able to make art. And that the more I could expose my students and my colleagues to that feeling that it is something special that we have in our lives, the better off we are, that we get to share those, those values and things. And um, I traveled a lot through Nepal. We ran workshops through the ranch for over 10 years. Uh, this next spring, we'll celebrate 25 years of running workshops in, in Jamaica. Jamaica. Yeah. Uh, there's an art center in, uh, outside of Santiago, Chile, that's modeled after Anderson Ranch. So our reach is, 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 is worldwide. And that was Pelusa, who that worked was with you for six years yep. before she went back went home back. and did that. But um, I began to realize after seeing how um, conditions can be so, in our minds, so bad or so terrible, but yet how so people can be so happy and have joy in their lives. And these were makers. These were people who were making objects, specifically potters. And so I felt an obligation. I felt the sense that I had to take people to see this, to experience this. And you were very supportive about it, and so was Jim. Um, um, and I actually got to say that, you know, Jim started field workshops. I mean, it was, right. yeah, it was Jim's idea to take people in the field, and I took it a little further and took people way out in the field. And, um, and you come back a different person, you know. Uh, and I imagine Jim probably feels the same way as that when we're in the airport leaving the country, I set everybody down and I say, look, I don't know how you're going to be changed. I don't know how you're going to come back, but I can guarantee you one thing, you will be changed mm -hmm. by this experience. Mm -hmm. And that's, the, you know, and then after a while I began to realize that, <laughs> that we actually are a field workshop. You know, Jim, it's like mm -hmm. people get on a plane to right. come here right. to have an experience and I had to go, whoa, boom. It's like, <laughs> you guys are on a field workshop. Hmm. And so um, I began to empathize with our students, how courageous they were, how brave they were, how vulnerable they were, and taking- Committed. Committed. Committed, and taking people into the field to see that same thing in a completely different value system, hmm. I think really impacted a lot of people. I know yeah. it did. Yeah. yeah. And now you've been going to Mexico lately. Yeah. We have a program in San Miguel. Mm -hmm. It's a little civilized. We just paint <laughs> on plates, but <laughs> um, and um, but uh, yeah, it's very civilized. Um, but I, you know, it's after living overseas for all those 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 years, I, I realized that um, young art students, in particular, need to see that. They need mm -hmm. to experience that. And and to me, it's about. You know, you need to understand how strong you are with your value system. And the only way you can do that is to test it against somebody else's value system. And you go to India or Nepal or Burma or Laos, and it, it is upside down, you yeah. know, the way we were brought up in these, these Western values. Yeah. And so um, my time working overseas, I really think, cemented the, cemented the notion that I'm going to be of service to our culture through arts activities, that that's how I'm going to connect people. And um, Now, you were in Jamaica yep. when we first contacted you. You had started their first stoneware. Was that a first stoneware first factory? First stoneware factory And how ever. many employees did you have? 48. And this was through the UN? Through the UN. Yeah. I was assigned to the Ministry of Culture, and the uh, member of parliament who was in charge of that particular portfolio was a guy named Edward Siaga. Edward just passed away this last year. He was the prime minister. I had no idea who this guy was. And uh, I would have meetings with the prime minister over 
developing craft and pottery industries in Trenchtown. And it is still and, going on? Well, the idea behind that project at that time was to privatize um, parts of it after three years, and so aspects of it went out into the field. And along the way, um, some interest was brought towards the ranch with my friend David Pinto. Would you want to come back and, mm -hmm. and start a program here? Um, and he actually came to the studio and he says, you know, you, you're pretty much known as the crazy white guy <laughs> that worked in Trenchtown. Hmm. And no. um, <laughs> you have a reputation. <laughs> uh, that's a crazy white guy. <laughs> yeah. And um, still to this day, guys, um, when I talk to people, even last spring, I was talking to somebody. Oh, yeah, I remember stories about you. <laughs> <laughs> so good or bad, they're, they're still there. Yeah. Another thing that I think really changed your life was when uh, John and Kimiko Powers came through with Takashi. That was what year? That was just after I left, I think. Yeah, that, that was a really interesting um, aspect. I mean, it was 92, 93. Mm -hmm. And um, you know how it is. We had, there are cocktail parties in Aspen and up and down the valley. And the, some of you probably know who Kimiko and John Powers are in the Powers Art Center down valley and how instrumental John was. And, bringing people to Aspen in the 60s and 70s. Yeah, during the, through the, uh, or the Aspen Institute. Aspen yeah. Institute. Yeah. And um, John had a, uh, a, had a friend, and his friend's name was Takashi Nagazato, and he was coming to town. Well, uh, John was invited, this is, I'm gonna give you the short story, but John was invited to a uh, dinner party, and he said, well, I'm not coming unless I can bring my <laughs> guest, which was Takashi. And I got a call from the host who said, well, uh, could you come? Because he's the only potter and everybody else won't know anybody. And it's like, can you, I'm like, okay, I'll come. And I came to this party and uh, Takashi and I sat down in front of the fireplace and sort of started to kind of pantomime our uh, relationship to Clay. And um, I know it pissed off the host, but John Powers got up, left the table, and came sat down at the floor. And then his wife, Kimiko, got up and sat down and sat at the floor. And I thought, oh, I'm in deep trouble here. And, um, but one thing led to another. And Takashi said, can I come work in your studio tomorrow? Like, <laughs> tomorrow? <laughs> and if you're in the Powers Art Center down Valley, there's a picture of him with this wild, massive hair. And that was his first visit in one of those old log buildings. And right. that was 25 years ago. And... Um, so what was going on at that time as well, a few years later, is that we were graced with a one-month visit uh, every year with Peter Volkus. Right. And, and I was going to ask you about that fire. You know what I'm talking about? I do. And I'm going to tell you <laughs> about that particular firing. So we built a big wood kill up here in the kill yard, modeled after the kill I'd saw in Karatsu, Japan, Takashi's kill, which was longer than this building and took days to fire. And I said, well, if you had your dream, what would you do? And he said, uh, build a smaller kill. Uh -huh. <laughs> and I said, okay, I and think I, I think Just I a could. little footnote, Takashi's a 12th generation potter. He is. And, and his and grandson now is the 14th. It's right, and yeah. so he's running it. Um, and so we built this kill, and the first two artists that I loaded this kill up with their work was Takashi Nagazato and Peter Volkus. I was like, whew, starstruck. Here we go. We're going to fire all this work. And the firing went great. Got to temperature. Everything functioned fine. And Pete was packing his work up and sending it off to the galleries. Just it's hot out of the kill. And Takashi was over here in the corner breaking everything. OK, I always think of Alice in Wonderland, the fork in the road, and the Cheshire cat. Doesn't matter what road you take, but pick one, mm. right? And I said to Takashi, I said, why are you breaking all this work? And he said, well, your kill fired great, but it fired too well. And all that ash on my pot just kills my forms. And so he was breaking all this work, breaking tens of thousands of dollars worth of work. And so I had a dilemma. I had a real dilemma right in front of me. I said, I can follow and support Peter Volkus in this firing and, and work with him, or I can align myself with Takashi and figure out what it is that he had to say. I chose Takashi. And I got to say that my work took a 180 degree shift at that moment 
and um, we've been working together ever since then. I spend time in his studio. He arrives tonight, yeah. folks, so he will be here for two months working in the visiting artist studio. Please come by and say hi to him. Um, he has graciously uh, donated all the work that he produces here, majority of it, to the visiting artist program. So he t internally understands the values of a place where you can come and explore and take risks without anybody watching. Yeah. Yeah. And I think he likes the youth here. A he's 82. He's 82. He, he puts me to shame and you to shame in terms yes, of does. production. Yes, he does. I mean, he will, if he starts tomorrow morning, which he will, yeah. he'll probably have 300 pots in five days, six days. Right. And he's flying directly from Italy. And, and it, it's, I mean, that's not an exaggeration. When mm -hmm. He told me when he was young, he would throw 700 teapots or tea bowls, but just little simple tea bowls, 700 yeah. though, in the morning, mm -hmm. make lunch and come back and trim them in the afternoon. That's right. Yeah. And now he can't do that. He's good for maybe 150. <laughs> yeah. Two maybe. Yeah. And um, we were fortunate to go to his 80th party, yep. birthday party, uh, two years ago in last November. And he had an, a stellar show in the Takashimaya, is that what it's called? Mm -hmm. Takashimaya uh, department store Sorry. in Tokyo. And um, I think 50 or 55 of the 80 pots, he had 80 pots for his 80th birthday, he made here. Made, made here. So two thirds of the show in Tokyo represented work that he made here. And that's how important he felt about the experience here. In fact, the photographs that announced him uh, when you walk into an exhibition in Japan, there's always a photograph of the artist. The photographs were photographed on Independence Pass. And that's how important the ranch has been <laughs> to him, that he chose to... to shirtless, standing there. Shirtless, yeah. Looking pretty strong. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Amazing photos. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so he has had a huge impact on my career, my art, and the way I think about my pots. And, um, yeah, what... What I'm doing. Yeah. I have to say, I've been, one of the things that's uh, been really fortunate for me knowing you is that I follow you around the world. Oh. Uh, <laughs> my first time uh, you were invited to go teach in Cortona for the University of Georgia. Right. And you couldn't go. So I took that job. Right. And then I got to go teach in Jamaica. Yeah. Got to go to Japan. Yeah. Visit Takashi. Yeah. Got to go to Chile with mm -hmm. Pelusa. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure there's more, but it's been great. Thanks, Doug. <laughs> Share the love, <laughs> right? Uh, another thing I should uh, bring up about the early times here is um, uh, Jim had come in with Laura Dixon, mm -hmm. and Molly Favor and I were here, and you and Susan, mm -hmm. and we were all on staff mm -hmm. and working. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think Laura worked here maybe a dozen years at least. Jim was director for, you said, 11 or 12, and you were here 20 years. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and you came in to move into that Fisher Photography Center, uh, actually, and Linda Gervin mm -hmm. brought you here, who's still in town, and she, was a, she knew you and uh, said, you might be interested in this job. And then uh, Sue Casebeer worked here, I think, for 17 years. That's correct. You know, so between those three families, and our kids grew up here. And our kids grew up here. There was a little mafia of kids. Mm -hmm. My daughter was the oldest, and she kind of ran the show. And... Uh, marched them around. Uh, Brad's daughter, Katrina, was, I think, the last person actually born on the ranch. Yes. And yeah. she got married here on the Two ranch. Years, three years ago. Yeah. 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 So family is a huge part of our organization. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Let's talk about the board's role. Mm -hmm. and the staff's role and how those have interacted mm -hmm. and the visiting artists at the faculty. See, there's, what I see here is, uh, well, let me put it this way. I have seen conflict on and off, as you would expect over 35 years, between staff and board or between staff and staff or board members and board members. To be expected. Not but the organ <laughs> <laughs> but But what I'm always very impressed with was when I come here, and I've come yeah. here to teach, and I've come here to be mm -hmm. a visiting, visiting mm -hmm. artist. Um, none of that filters down into what the place is about. The workshops, the residence, which mm -hmm. is a very important program right. in the winter, 
And the visiting artists don't see that. It's all like, mm -hmm. it just works here. Mm -hmm. And I think you kind of set the tone on that. Uh, every, wow. every, the departments here are phenomenally well run. Mm -hmm. And uh, Well, it's, uh, you know, I, I think back about it and I think, wow, boy, myself and you and Jim and Peter Korn and I don't think any of us had a business class under our belts, right? And we're running this business that started out of, I kind of remember, a quarter million dollar budget. And by the time you left, it was one and a half. And now we're up to like over five million. And these are artists. But the, the, the thing I think that really um, made it all work was that we were so focused on the artist experience that you come here to learn, you come here to grow, you come here to take risks, and you're not judged. You leave your ego in the parking lot. Mm -hmm. And I think that those values permeated through all the staff and all of our programming and everything we do. And the visiting artists and feel that way. And the visiting artists, you know. They, they just um, uh, are comfortable. Yeah. Um, and I know you feel this way. I know Jim does. But we got to hire our heroes. Yeah. We really did. I mean, where else do you have that opportunity to call somebody up on the phone and say, come out here and work? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, Brad and Janice, let's make some dinnerware. Yeah. You know, it's like, yeah. uh, Ned, let's make this tile project yeah. that's like... Ned Smyth is a sculptor yeah. and still working in New York. And mm -hmm. you took on a huge project for him, which was eight by... 45 feet. Yeah. 145 one, tiles. One foot square. It's yeah. a, a scene of buffaloes. Mm -hmm. running at you, yeah, and uh, that was built in the basement of the photo building yeah. over a long yeah. period of time. So that show, that piece toured for several years, and it's in a permanent collection, I believe in Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh. But Ned told me a story later. He said, we hung that show several times, once in New York, and traveled around. And we made all these tiles, and we uh, had to research Velcro. Remember right, that? Right, right, I do. So Velcro, just for fact, one square inch has 13 pounds of shear strength. And so we were hanging 5,000 pounds of clay on the wall. And so Ned had hung that show for probably the third or fourth time, and he was walking by it one day. You remember this story? And he was walking by it one day, and he was just staring at it, and one tile fell out in his hands. I yes. forgot to put Velcro on one White. tile. Yeah. Yeah, and, and he if caught he it. caught that, yeah. and if it had broke, the whole thing. I think he had a piece of, uh, he had a cup of coffee in his hand, and he just set it down yeah. before the tire fell. Yeah. So, so, yeah, <laughs> yeah. We take on a lot. I think the ranch is very ambitious in terms of the projects we take on. We mm -hmm. we learn as much about ourselves and what we can do, as well as exposing different techniques and processes to a variety of artists. Mm -hmm. And um, Rafael Ferrer and I have made plates, and Roberto Juarez and. And the idea that we can cross-pollinate and get those other artists into other studios and do prints or make furniture or get Harry into to make coffee tables, you know. Uh, I think that's the real charm of the ranch is that we kind of level the playing field and, mm. and allow everybody to come in and explore. Yeah, I remember uh, Jim also had a term for some of the returning faculty, which he, I think you called them the sacred cows. Right, sacred and, cows. And uh, Jamie Azell was one of them, who was a yeah. highly successful commercial. Yeah. Uh, you know. Yeah. Um, Ken and Victor. Arlene Raven was one. The Gills. Arlene Raven, remember those workshops she taught? <sighs> brutal. brutal, absolutely brutal. Yeah. And God, why she paired me with Peter Korn, I don't know. <laughs> uh, but she did that twice, I think, Jim. I think she did that workshop twice, and I talk about Arlene <clears throat> to this day because. I think that Arlene got my head on straight about talking about my work. Well, that's what she and, came here. Arlene yeah. came. She was a, a critic, mm -hmm. a writer. She worked for the Village Voice for decades. Yeah. And um, she would come in here and run a workshop about writing about your work. Yeah. And it was like some of the first critical studies workshops, really. Mm -hmm. Didn't have that name yet. Mm. And uh, I think Kathleen Lowe eventually mm -hmm. took that and, yep, and absolutely. put that on the map. I still... Uh, refine and work on the artist statement that Arlene had me write. Oh, uh -huh. It is still <laughs> part of what I do. Yeah. So, and I actually, to Arlene's credit, I teach that technique now about hmm. how to arrive at an artist statement. Hmm. I don't know if you remember. Jim probably does all those pages of stuff we had to fill out. She actually did a workshop uh, in-house for the staff, right? Yeah. 
yeah, it was very I difficult. I think it was more about getting us all to talk together, right? <laughs> Figure out how to work together? Yeah, yeah. yeah I think so. <laughs> hmm. Well, let's see how much time we got here. Oh, we got 15 minutes. Should we open this up? Um, Is there anything else? You got anything? What are you well, asking? Well, I'll just, uh, let, me, let me kind of, uh, I have a little thing to say about you, which is I would, it, it's clear that you have had the most impact of any person being associated with Ranch for young, longevity. You have been in so many of the meetings with board, staff, artists that have transformed this place. And uh, I'm really glad they're thanking you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Anybody have a question? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry. No questions. Um, <laughs> Jim has one. Uh, Doug, could you talk a little bit about the beginning of the artist in residence program? Oh, yeah. Uh, right. That was a real big change. Something oh. I didn't like initially. Uh, yes, I know. Effort. Yeah. Well, you, you uh, a huge difference there in getting that going. Well, uh, I was asking Brad about this. Do you remember the yellow cheese incident? Oh, yes. See, see? <laughs> pretty much. Yeah, we forced eight artists and residents to live in the ranch house, and one of them did not like yellow cheese. And so we had to figure out how to get eight people to get along and not have yellow cheese in the ranch house. So, but the the, the thing about the artists and residency program was really altruistic in the sense that we wanted to run a stellar summer workshop program, and. Um, in order to do that, and I know that this was a, sort of a leap of faith for the board because um, we were constantly repairing and fixing equipment and studios and facilities, and to have a winter program meant that we were protecting our investment for the summer program. And I knew, and Jim knew this, that there was a need to serve younger artists, that coming right out of grad school, there weren't a lot of teaching jobs at that time, and they needed to refine their portfolio. And so we started with eight ceramic artists. Jane Dillon was one of them early on. And Matt Christie was part of that group. And uh, so it was an opportunity to winterize all the facilities and protect our investment that we have for our summer program. And by doing that, our summer program was uh, escalated to this premier facility. And so it was really kind of hard, because a lot of you come and go through the summer here to understand what the relationship is between the artist and residency program in the summer, but it is this facility. It is all these buildings and equipment that we've put together over the years and allowing artists to come in. And I remember those conversations at Bruce Berger going, this doesn't make money. Right, right. <laughs> I'm like, no, but we're not spending money fixing stuff every year and look what we're building to create this incredible experience for our summer students. And I really expect, I, I really respect Bruce for kind of really, you know, cutting through all the crap on that one. But it was like the artist, and I do believe this, and I and and I I think that it will become this. I think it's on the verge of this. That uh, we do summer workshops, we transform people's lives, we make a difference in people's lives. But the artist and residency program reaches worldwide in a way that n no other program can. And uh, it is out there uh, serving us and speaking about us uh, in countries around the world. And um, so the Artists in Residency program really had a crucial part in sustaining the summer workshop program and creating this incredible, wonderful facility. It also is uh, really exciting to walk around in the winter and see these facilities being used the way they are. Yeah. It's, yeah. Th that's my favorite thing that happens here is the residency program. It is, mm -hmm. It's kind of a sleeper to most people because it's kind of insulated. Right. It's a, it's a gift of time and space to mm -hmm. come work, yeah. you know, and we'll provide the support and the and facilities. And how many people applied last year? I think Liz. 355. Yes, it yeah. has. 355, if you didn't hear that. We started out with eight. And we select 14 in the fall. and. 14 in the spring, and we're partnering with Dennis Scholl in Miami and shifting the model a little bit. And what I like about that is that these people like Dennis are going, this is incredible value. 
This is an incredible hmm. place. We're going to send our artists there. And so I imagine, Liz, you are going to see more of that coming your way. So um, I think the residency program really said to the world that we run year-round. We run activities year-round. Mm -hmm. And that we are a full-fledged art center. I think that also happens like when the Haas brothers come in. You know, they take that back and mm -hmm. they talk about this place. That's right. And how wonderful it was and how people jumped in to help and, mm -hmm. you know, the facilities, mm -hmm. the whole thing. And they've That's got right. a crew of 20 back in L.A., you know, but yeah. they like yeah. coming here. Well, it's, it's like I'm reminded uh, when I asked Takashi, why do you keep coming here? I'm unencumbered by tradition. I can mm -hmm. make whatever I want here with support from you all. Mm -hmm. And that was just when I, I just went, whoa, mm -hmm. you just defined our existence mm -hmm. right there. Why we're, in, why we're here. Mm -hmm. Yes. Hi, Doug. Hi, Helen. Thank you for that. So can I want to know about this artist statement that you've been revising. Can you say a little something about maybe how it started and what changed in it? Well, it started with a complete legal pad filled of stuff that had to be distilled down to two pages to one pages to seven sentences. And it had to transcend uh, material and process and get right at value. What do you stand for in your work? And Arlene was just remarkable about calling bullshit. Bullshit, bullshit. No, nope, go back. That ain't working. And so uh, for most of you that know me, I grew up on the plains of Kansas and Oklahoma, and I, it, I'm a, I'll say this straight up, I'm a slow learner. <laughs> it's taken a while to figure out who I am a little bit. But uh, I, I really feel, and Arlene uh, just hammered away at me, you are a product of place. You are a product of who you are, where you came from. Mm. And those values establish who you are as an artist. Go deep. And she would say things like, mind your personal history. It's all there. You know, don't make it up. The make up shit, that's, that's what it is, you know. And so, our, you know, Jim, I remember those conversations were tough, really, really tough. And then once I realized that, yeah, I am a product of my space and place, and that the way I think about geometry and composition has to do with the plains and the prairie and the sky and the buildings, and, and the fact that I don't see that any different than setting a table with dishes, and that that's the, play, that's the mesa, that's the plateau, those are the objects on the landscape. And she got me to that point of understanding that all you got to do is honor who you are and where you came from, and that's where you start. And um, uh, I try to teach that. You know, it's like I have students that come to me and say, well, what's the magic bullet? You know, like, how do you get to where you're at? I go, you got to look inside. You got to go deep. It's all right there, but you, you got to bring it forward. And once you do, then nobody can take it away from you. And when Arlene said that, it was like, nobody can take it away from me. Then I was in. And uh, so I talk about uh, honoring rural vernacular and in the architecture on the, of the prairie and how that's influenced my sense of uh, structure, form, and shape. Some of you do know this, but I'm a failed architect. Harry laughs. <laughs> I went to school to study architecture, but calculus kicked my ass. And uh, I don't know, why, do, why the hell do they make people take calculus in architecture? But uh, I am a builder, and I'm influenced by building and structures on the landscape. And Arlene unlocked all that for me. And uh, that's what I try to teach, unlock what's inside of you. That's where the, the art comes from. Does that help? Thank you. Yes, Harry. I, I want to have a second, Chris. Thank you for uh, presiding over the. I want to thank you for uh, our, our second, Brad's. Thank you for presiding over the transition. But I will also want to do something almost more important. I want to thank you for not screwing it up. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, 
That's wow. been the goal of the of mine ever since I started being involved here. It, 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 you know, it's just it's all so good. Yeah. You just don't want to mess it up. Yeah. That's the thing. Yeah, I'm. Yeah. Uh, I remembered. Uh, I, I'm reminded of a board meeting. Maybe it was a strategic planning meeting or something where Paul Copagan said, "Don't lose the funk. That's who you yeah. are." Mm. And I, I really remember that. That. If you get too sophisticated and too polished, you've lost who you really are. And um, I mean, you've been a big part of that, helping keep that funk alive. So thanks, Harry. And one of the unsung heroes uh, of this place is Dave Beck. Uh, Dave, and Dave built all the buildings in his crew. I remember him building this one. Yeah. And I remember you would brown bag it, which is, uh, they didn't have the most complete plans. It was like bare bones plans and they would talk every day on site, you know, well, what are we going to do here? And then you end up with a building like this. I think know. it was called uh, Design Build. Design Build. <laughs> oh, and there's another, there, one more thing, though. <laughs> this place grew organically. Yes. It, did, it, it was over maybe 10, 15 years that mm -hmm. the building really developed. Mm -hmm. So, Just yeah. Just to clarify, what I really was talking about, too, was the spirit and psychology and sociology of the place as much as the mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, we know. <laughs> no, it, it passed muster at the front end. <laughs> uh, yeah, it ha yeah. There's no supports in here, Harry. <laughs> well, there is around the Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I'm reminded, um, I think I was in town about a week, and um, <laughs> you said we're going to a cocktail party. You remember where we went? No. Nancy and Scott's house. Oh. And that was my first introduction to the Aspen art community mm -hmm. was at Nancy and Scott's house. Mm -hmm. And you guys were living in Smuggler or somewhere. Yeah. Employee yeah. Yeah. I clearly remember that. I thought, mm, I've walked into a really neat group of people. So thank you guys. <laughs> okay. So meeting you at that time, what I loved so much was the character you brought into the arts community here. And I want you to talk a bit about your style of listening. Because we, you and I have sat on a few boards, and you have taught me so much about how you listen. Wow, Nancy. Um, I don't, Jim, I wasn't a very good listener, was I? <laughs> uh, I think it's a learned skill, but for sure, one of my values is that um, to listen. And I, and I learned that value working in the Caribbean, working in Jamaica, in Trenchtown, that if you don't listen and honor everybody's presence, that you're not going to get anything done. And I teach that with my staff, very simple, go around and say good morning to everybody and listen, right? Listen to what they have to say. And um, patience and tolerance, you know? We all have something to bring to the table. I think yesterday you said you wouldn't have your staff do any job that you wouldn't do also. That is true. Yeah. yeah. And uh, this reminds me of a gentleman that stepped into our lives named Floyd Mann mm -hmm. back in early 80s. Floyd was an organizational psychologist that was retired. He was from Madison, uh, a professor, professor emeritus from Madison, Wisconsin. He was at the ground floor of a whole new field called organizational psychology. And he worked with uh, UPS, Ford, mm -hmm. you know, from, from the floor to the CEO. Mm -hmm. And he came in, and I remember the first, he sat in our staff meetings as a volunteer mm -hmm. and said, oh, I think I can help you uh, figure out some of how this place works. And he would sit in with a the staff and not say a word. And this happened for months with staff mm -hmm. meetings. He'd sit and listen. He'd take me back to the office and he'd tell me what happened in the meeting. Who say, who, when they said this, that's what they meant. And then he worked with the whole staff mm -hmm. and the board. He ran board retreats. He was very instrumental, that kind mm -hmm. of, uh, it, it taught me that I had skills about mm -hmm. organizational skills. And then you had Stan. That's right. 
That's right. That's right. That's a good point. Uh, he walked into the office and said, my son took a workshop here from Sam Aloof and it changed his life. And he's still a woodworker. This is in the early 80s. I owe it to you. Yeah. And uh, mm -hmm. he wanted to work. He did not want to retire. Mm -hmm. you know? And uh, so he worked, and he worked with Robert Harth at the MA very seriously. Mm -hmm. And he worked with Francis Chavez after, when mm -hmm. I left. Mm -hmm. uh, so he was very instrumental. Yeah, he taught me one very important skill in that you will not understand what somebody's saying to, to you unless you repeat it back to them. <laughs> Hmm. then you understand what they're saying. Hmm. And I try to use that technique. I'm like, what did you say? Can you repeat that? So you try me? to use that technique? All the time. Okay. <laughs> I try. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, so can we pick on him a little bit? So um, I got to say this. It's like, this, this guy's the king of corn right here. This guy right here is Mr. Double Entendre. Right? Right, Jim? So we're like, wait a minute, what did he just say? Most of them just... Right by you? No, no by, by us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they are bad. They're quite bad. Some, yeah, some, <laughs> most of them work. Yeah. Some of them, you know, they come and you don't expect that they actually might have a triple. Mm -hmm. That's really exciting. A triple on time. Yeah, that does happen. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That one went... It's not thought out, it just happens. It just happens? Well, that one went right by me. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you, you know, Brad brought a lot of brevity to the organization and uh, really kind of put four guys together that could work together and build a program. So mm -hmm. we owe you a debt of gratitude. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, let's see how we doing time-wise. 601, we're supposed to be done. We'll field more questions if anybody wants. Um, Dinner's going to be served. Mm -hmm. We can take another question or two. Yeah. Anything out there? Yeah. Yes. Why has it thank you? I got to write my artist statement this year, Naomi Shepard Smith. Oh. Ah. Naomi Shepard Smith. Um, I got to write my artist statement this summer with Doug K. Spear. Oh. And. Uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> It was probably one of the most difficult courses I have ever taken in my entire life, but I'm really happy I did, and I'm looking forward to the future. Thank you. Thanks, Naomi. Miss Evelyn. Behind every great man, there is a great woman. <laughs> We have our Stella Children's Program at the ranch today because of Sue Casebeer, who started with a little art show from the, uh, the teachers in the public schools who sent in drawings, some of them on notebook paper. And she asked me and she asked Marion Davis if we would participate. And we did, and we started having little children's art shows. And Sue Casebeer put her whole heart into it as if they were going to get a master's degree. <laughs> Fast forward now, over 30 years, we have a fully developed children's program that is recognized around the country. And it's because of her ingenuity and her help with the ranch in a thousand different ways. She worked here as a, as a secretary, and she worked here with her whole heart. So I think that today it's fitting that we recognize Sue Case Spear. <laughs> Thank you, Evelyn. You know, it's called the Evelyn and Martin Siegel Children's Building. <laughs> <laughs> you did a great thing for the ranch. Thank you. One uh, more? 
How are we doing? Rona. <laughs> extraordinary at the ranch um, and you know a lot of us call it the special juju that's just in the soil here that everybody has to walk on when we walk through the different areas you know when you started you know the ranch and you had the original mission how did you keep this heart and soul and grow it to such a degree over so many years with so many changes in the world around you that it is such a safe haven and a place of humility and a place of fearlessness and a place of great joy for so many people? You know, I, th I think for me it's a very simple thing um, in that I'm going to honor you for being here and that everybody has something to offer to each other. And that value right there allows everybody to come together and teach each other. And that is really what I try to foster and encourage, that, that, that up and down mentoring and learning is really important at the ranch. And that everybody has something to offer. And that's what I try to encourage, you know, bring people together from disparate parts of the world, different backgrounds, and be able to support each other in this activity. And it might be that, you know, you you don't make art full time for a living or not, but you've met somebody, you've met a friend who now is part of your life that will support what you do or you support what they do. And, you know, just think of what the ranch has done across the country and around the world and how people are interact interacting. Um, one of our past residents, Emily Jasir, is starting an art center in Palestine, occupied mm -hmm. Jerusalem from having an experience at the Anderson Ranch. That's how we impact the world. But we have to level the playing field. We have to respect each other in order to do that. So I think that that's how we keep it real here. And Emily Every went on to have a show at the Hirshhorn. Yes. You know, from the residency program here. Mm -hmm. She came from Palestine to here. Yeah. I remember mm -hmm. her painting. Yeah. And uh, yeah. developed I think we all honor our, ourselves by being here. And, um, yeah, that's what I do. <laughs> well, are we done? We're done. We'll hang around if anybody wants to chat. There's a lot of people I want to hug in the room, so. Yeah, thanks for coming, everyone. <laughs> and thanks for being part of the ranch. Yeah.